By this time next year, the two projected frontrunners in the presidential election will be 78 and 81 years old. Is that too old for the most powerful position in the world? According to a Quinnipiac University poll published just last week, 61% of voters support an age limit to run for president. In the same poll, 68% said Joe Biden was too old for a second term, and 63% said the same for Donald Trump. And then there's Congress, where top leaders on both sides of the aisle have prompted concerns about age and ability in recent months. So is it time for a new generation of politicians to step up? And will the baby boomers and silent generation even let that happen? I'm joined today by Michael Astru, former associate counsel to President Ronald Reagan, who drafted the first operations plan for the 25th Amendment, and Jesse Mermel, the president and founder of DeWitt Impact Group. Mike, tell us how the 25th Amendment works. Well, it's very complicated, uh, probably unnecessarily so, but the shorthand is that if the vice president and and that word and is important because it means both, and a majority of the cabinet um, conclude that the president is medically unfit for office, um, they can make a determination that goes to Congress. The president has a certain amount of time to try to object. It goes back and forth, but essentially it puts up the, uh, it leads to the possibility that a two-thirds vote in both houses can mean that the president is removed um, at least on a temporary basis. Um, and the vice president becomes the acting president, not the president. Um, and that's a, the shorthand of how it works. So given this sort of level of complexity, Jesse, does it even seem possible that someone would evoke the 25th Amendment, no matter, in, no matter how obvious the handicap of the president? Well, I think it's certainly necessary that it's that complicated, right? That's not something that you want to be easy, that someone can snap their fingers and remove the president. But I don't think it's anything within the realm of possibility. I, I mean, just because th folks might think that Joe Biden is older than they'd like the president to be doesn't mean we're in a position where we have to be discussing the 25th Amendment. That feels well beyond where we are. So, I mean, even step setting aside the Joe Biden question, right? This, like, we have had this issue in the past with Ronald Reagan and Alzheimer's in the, in the second, and towards the end of his second term. And it goes back to the beginning of the United States of America. George Washington had memory issues at, towards the end of his second term as well. So the, these are issues we've dealt with before, but not maybe all that successfully. So, Mike, is there any possibility, and even setting Joe Biden aside, right? Like, for any pre we know there were discussions about the invocation of the 25th Amendment during the end of the Trump administration. Yes. Yes. And, I mean, like, they didn't happen. If there's a more clear-cut case than a viol violent insurgency against the, uh, the Capitol building, I'm not sure what it would be. So is this actually just a dead letter? Well, I think in the case of Trump, you have to remember that the time period was very short. Um, and these are difficult and unprecedented conversations. So... Um, I'd be a little careful about drawing a conclusion about that. They may have just simply run out of time. Um, and it's a time period where cabinet people were leaving. There's some lack of clarity in the amendment what happens um, if you don't have a confirmed cabinet official, if you have an acting official. So there's all kinds of complexities, um, which to give credit where it's credit due, the, the Clinton White House wrote a very good legal document about a lot of those. And I'm hoping that... Uh, White House counsel, um, attorney general, have access not only to my operations plan, but the, the Clinton White House uh, counsel document, which is really, really good. Um, and I think if it comes to the point where there's serious discussion on the 25th Amendment, if you're relying on standards that have been done in the past with no connection to the politics of today, I think it will make it more credible, less controversial. It will do less damage to our democracy if there are um, some precedents like that that they can rely on. Okay, so setting aside the theoretical discussion of the law surrounding the 20, 25th Amendment, it does seem like the biggest political problem that Joe Biden has right now is that a lot of Americans have concerns about his age. What's the White House thinking and planning on saying about that? Well, the White House has not called me to share their thinking, but I'll tell you what I think they need to do. I think they need to get Joe Biden out in the country, visible, showing how active and strong and thoughtful he is, and talking about the things that he's done over the past 
by the time we're at election time, four years, and the plans that he has for the future. The great news is that he has an incredibly strong record of things that appeal to most voters, right? Prescription drug reform, infrastructure building, just this past week taking action about uh, oil and gas leases in Alaska. He has a very, very strong record. I don't know that that's effectively being communicated to voters right now, but getting him out there showing how active and strong he is, how on top of things he is, and what he's already accomplished, that's the key to success. So, I mean, the Democratic Party's traditional posture of panic is clearly setting in right now as, the, as they look at polling data. It is one of our strengths. Yes, I mean, yeah. as, you know, the traditional formation of the Democratic Party is the circular firing squad, and we're, uh, we're well into that depth at this point. But, I mean, this isn't just a Democratic issue. Mitch McConnell just had, you know, two unknown, two, two new, you know, incidents of unknown cause right on camera. And I'll just know that Donald Trump just gave a speech in which he declared his fears that Barack Obama would lead us into World War II. So there's certainly a case that we're having more than, you know, that the age question is more a, a bipartisan issue. So I wonder then if we could ask, what is going on in American politics that we, we seem to be becoming something that looks awfully like a gerontocracy? Well, I, I think it's, I don't think in some ways anything has changed. What has changed is the technology and we're much more aware of it. My wife and I both worked in Congress right out of college. I worked in the Senate for Republicans. She worked in the House for a Democrat. Um, it was, while it was much more civil, productive, and efficient, it was very tough to see incontinent segregationists with all the positions of power um, in the major Senate committees. And so that's been going, but the problem is nobody knew. You know, we didn't have social media. You know, we had three, four television networks. Um, and there was sort of a social compact that you didn't cover, that kind of thing. Um, and what's changed now is there are so many different ways to physically see what's going on. And what is hurting the president now is it's not the partisan shots, because I think Americans have kind of turned off you know, the partisan shots from the other side, they're not paying much attention. I think the videos are speaking for themselves, and some of the videos are very disturbing of, you know, what it says about the president's capacity. And so I think a lot of people are watching it closely. So far, as far as I know, there's been no major problem that's come from any of these things, but people are worried, and I think they are right to be concerned. I, I mean, I, I would disagree. I, I look at those videos, you know, he tripped coming off a stage, what was that, two or three months ago? I, I mean, a few months ago, I almost wiped out in Wegmans because I tripped and slammed my legs into the, uh, the shopping cart. So I, mean, I, mean, I think we, people look at that and, and yeah. understand that folks are human. But you're absolutely right. We see it on replay over and over and over again. And folks on the other side have the opportunity to spin it in ways and to add their commentary to it in ways that just haven't been possible in the past. Right. And, and I am very understanding of the tripping and momentary forgetfulness. I'm there myself, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm very tolerant. I think what, for me, just speaking for myself, what has caused concern, and I think a lot of Americans share this, is it has seemed in the last few months he's very confidently stating things as facts which is just knowably not true. And, you know, and, and, and teaching political theory at the University of Pennsylvania and things like that. Um, and sometimes he's close, it's in his own, but it does start to make you concerned that he's getting a little detached from reality. And in the world we live in, that's a very dangerous thing. So again, I, I think that we ought to be treating the president with respect. It should not become part of the, the partisan critique. Um, and I think that the world treated Ronald Reagan very unfairly in this regard. You go back and you look at the clips of Ronald Reagan, there's nothing that's as disturbing as some of the things that we're seeing now from, McDonald, from McConnell, you know, from, uh, from, from Biden. And I was there for the last year, and I was there on the last day when Ronald Reagan spontaneously talked to the 70 most senior people still left without notes, without a teleprompter, for about a half an hour, and it was elegant and eloquent and no sign of any sort of mental incapacity. Um, I think the standard has changed because people 
want to defend the president's policies. That's understandable. But I think if you try to look at it objectively, it's very hard to say there's no basis for concern based on the videos of the last six months. Listen, I'm not concerned with how many trips someone has around the sun. I'm concerned with their worldview. I'm concerned with their energy approaching the job. We can all name folks who are 25 or 30, some of whom have the, uh, the maturity of a 10-year-old and others who are wise beyond their years. And I can think of multiple elected officials who are well in their 80s, who are sharp as a tack and doing great forward-thinking work. When I look at the positions of the Biden administration, it is forward-thinking, it is energetic. They are getting things done for the people of America. I think they need to get the president out there more so that voters can see that. But I don't think we have a situation where we need to be concerned about the president's capacity, talking about the 25th Amendment. Anything along those lines seems vastly out of line. So, I mean, the tripping and falling, it's, it's like medically, the tripping and falling is a normal thing. It's, the most impressive thing was the fact that he got right, that, right back yeah, up, yeah, which yeah, actually yeah. is a really good sign I'm for his physical condition. Um, and, I mean, the, vid the videos, I say, like, he, he, he's about as coherent as I was when I'm that jet lagged, so it's, it's hard for me to interpret. But I'm sort of stepping out from the Biden thing, this is not just about Joe Biden, right? We have a Supreme Court of people who right. are, you know, hold on, to, hold on for forever, long past the point where it's clear that there are some, there's issues there. That's bipartisan. Um, senior members of the Republican Party, Dianne Feinstein in the Senate clearly has, has issues that sort of lay question of their competence. So, so I think we have to ask the question, like, what is the political system just failing that it is continuing to allow people who have reached the point where it is not clear that they can any longer do their job, hold on power for not just years, but I mean, for, at this point, it seems like multiple terms in office. Yeah, it, it, again, it's not a new phenomenon. Um, William O. Douglas was embarrassing on the court in late years um, and, um, you know, was not, able to, was not able to function. We've seen this before. The question is, what do you do and how do you handle it? And I think there are different responses in the courts and in the Congress. In the Congress, the voters ultimately can decide. And I think that what ought to happen in a lot of these situations is what used to happen more in the old days is that the state parties and the governors, say it's a senator, would get together and try to figure out some way to go to talk to the relevant senator and say, look, your time has come. We want you to step down. And then you try to offer up on the short term, the most palatable alternative, you know, possible. Um, and sometimes that used to work and sometimes that didn't. The parties have kind of broken down and so you don't see that happen anymore, but that's what ought to happen, I think, in the Congress a little bit more often. So I think about two things. One, to state the obvious and maybe something that is awkward to say, but seniors have huge voting power. And so I think political parties, everyone of all stripes, are reluctant to say something, imply something that might offend an incredibly powerful, reliable voting bloc. So that piece, I think, is real. Whether it's appropriate or not kind of doesn't matter. It's a political reality. The second piece is there, is there are signs of hope. The median age of the House has gone down, not insignificantly. Look at, even though he's not my favorite person, the speaker, the minority leader, age-wise, right? Uh, those are big shifts. We now have a Gen Z member of Congress. If you look at state legislatures and city councils around the country, you're seeing folks in their 20s and 30s getting elected. The pipeline is there. Whether or not there's the generational shift at the top to create room for folks to move up is a whole different conversation. But I think we'd be... Um, not, we'd be doing a disservice to your viewers if we didn't point out that there is this bubbling energy of folks in their 20s, 30s, 40s who are anxious to serve and who are maybe at a slower pace than I might like, but are getting in there and making inroads uh, in public service. So it's not all doom and gloom. Jesse Murmel, Michael Astru, thanks.